Armenia is the second most densely populated of the former Soviet republics because of its small size. It is situated between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, bordered on the north and east by Georgia and Azerbaijan and on the south and west by Iran and Turkey. Until independence, Armenia's economy was based largely on industry, chemicals, electronic products, machinery, processed food, synthetic rubber and textiles. It was highly dependent on outside resources. Agriculture accounted for only 20% of net material product and 10% of employment before the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991. Armenian mines produce copper, zinc, gold and lead. The vast majority of energy is produced with imported fuel, including gas and nuclear fuel from Russia. The main domestic energy source is hydroelectric. Small amounts of coal, gas and petroleum have not yet been developed. Like other former states, Armenia's economy suffers from the legacy of a centrally planned economy and the breakdown of former Soviet trading patterns. Soviet investment in and support of Armenian industry has virtually disappeared, so that few major enterprises are still able to function. In addition, the effects of the 1988 earthquake, which killed more than 25,000 people and made 500,000 homeless, are still being felt. Although a ceasefire has held since 1994, the conflict with Azerbaijan over Nagorno-Karabakh has not been resolved. The consequent blockade along both the Azerbaijani and Turkish borders has devastated the economy. Because of Armenia's dependence on outside supplies of energy and most raw materials, land routes through Azerbaijan and Turkey are closed, routes through Georgia and Iran are adequate and reliable. In 1992-93, the GDP had fallen nearly 60% from its 1989 level. The national currency, the DRAM, suffered hyperinflation for the first few years after its introduction in 1993. Armenia has registered strong economic growth since 1995 and inflation has been negligible for the past several years. New sectors, such as precious stone processing and jewelry making and communication technology. This steady economic progress has earned Armenia increasing support from international institutions. The International Monetary Fund, World Bank, EBRD, as well as other international financial institutions and foreign countries are extending considerable grants and loans. Total loans extended to Armenia since 1993 exceed $800 million. These loans are targeted at reducing the budget deficit, stabilizing the local currency, developing private businesses, energy, the agriculture, food processing, transportation, and health and education sectors, and ongoing rehabilitation work in the earthquake zone. Continued progress will depend on the ability of the government to strengthen its macroeconomic management, including increasing revenue collection, improving the investment climate, and accelerating privatization. A liberal foreign investment law was approved in June 1994, and a law on privatization was adopted in 1997, as well as a program on state property privatization. The government has made major strides toward joining the World Trade Organization. By 1994, however, the Armenian government had launched an ambitious IMF-sponsored economic liberalization program that resulted in positive growth rates in 1995 to 2005. Armenia joined the World Trade Organization in January 2003. Armenia also has managed to slash inflation, stabilize its currency, and privatize most small and medium-sized enterprises. Armenia's unemployment rate, however, remains high, despite strong economic growth. The chronic energy shortages Armenia suffered in the early and mid-1990s have been offset by the energy supplied by one of its nuclear power plants. At Metsimor, Armenia is now a net energy exporter, although it does not have sufficient generating capacity to replace Metsimor, which is under international pressure to close. 
The electricity distribution system was privatized in 2002. Armenia's severe trade imbalance has been offset somewhat by international aid, remittances from Armenians working abroad, and foreign direct investment. Economic ties with Russia remain close, especially in the energy sector. The government made some improvements in tax and customs administration in 2005, but anti-corruption measures have been more difficult to implement. Investment in the construction and industrial sectors is expected to continue in 2006 and will help to ensure annual average real GDP growth of about 13.9%. Overview. Under the old Soviet central planning system, Armenia had developed a modern industrial sector, supplying machine tools, textiles, and other manufactured goods to sister republics in exchange for raw materials and energy. Since the implosion of the USSR in December 1991, Armenia has switched to small-scale agriculture away from the large agro-industrial complexes of the Soviet era. The agricultural sector has long-term needs for more investment and updated technology. The privatization of industry has been at a slower pace, but has been given renewed emphasis by the current administration. Armenia is a food importer, and its mineral deposits are small. The ongoing conflict with Azerbaijan over the ethnic Armenian-dominated region of Nagorno-Karabakh and the breakup of the centrally directed economic system of the former Soviet Union contributed to a severe economic decline in the early 1990s. By 1994, however, the Armenian government had launched an ambitious IMF-sponsored economic program that has resulted in positive growth rates in 1995-99. Armenia also managed to slash inflation and to privatize most small and medium-sized enterprises. The chronic energy shortages Armenia suffered in recent years have been largely offset by the energy supplied by one of its nuclear power plants at Metsimor. Continued Russian financial difficulties have hurt the trade sector especially, but have been offset by international aid, domestic restructuring and foreign direct investment. History of the modern Armenian economy At the beginning of the 20th century, the territory of present-day Armenia was a backward agricultural region with some copper mining and cognac production. From 1914 through 1921, Caucasian Armenia suffered from war, revolution, the influx of refugees from Turkish Armenia, disease, hunger and economic misery. About 200,000 people died in 1919 alone. At that point, only American relief efforts saved Armenia from total collapse. Budget ran large deficits. The first Soviet Armenian government regulated economic activity stringently, nationalizing all economic enterprises, requisitioning grain from peasants, and suppressing most private market activity. This first experiment of state control ended with the advent of Soviet leader Vladimir Lenin's new economic policy of 1921-27. This policy continued state control of the large enterprises and banks, but peasants could market much of their grain, and small businesses could function. In Armenia, the NEP years brought partial recovery from the economic disaster of the post-World War I period. By 1926 agricultural production in Armenia had reached nearly three-quarters of its pre-war level. By the end of the 1920s, Stalin's regime had revoked the NEP and established a state monopoly on all economic activity. Once this occurred, the main goal of Soviet economic policy in Armenia was to turn a predominantly agrarian and rural republic into an industrial and urban one. Amongst other restrictions, Peasnats now were forced to sell nearly all their output to state procurement agencies rather than at the market. From the 1930s through the 1960s, an industrial infrastructure was constructed, 
Besides hydroelectric plants and canals, roads were built and gas pipelines were laid to bring fuel and food from Azerbaijan and Russia. The Stalinist command economy, in which market forces were suppressed and all orders for production and distribution came from state authorities, survived in all its essential features until the fall of the Soviet regime in 1991. In the early stages of the communist economic revolution, Armenia underwent a fundamental transformation into a proletarian society. Between 1929 and 1939, the percentage of Armenia's workforce categorized as industrial workers grew from 13% to 31%. By 1935 industry supplied 62% of Armenia's economic production. Highly integrated and sheltered within artificial barter economy of the Soviet system from the 1930s until the end of the communist era, the Armenian economy showed few signs of self-sufficiency at any time during that period. In 1988 Armenia produced only 0.9% of the net material product of the Soviet Union. The republic retained 1.4% of total state budget revenue, delivered 63.7% of its NMP to other republics, and exported only 1.4% of what it produced to markets outside the Soviet Union. Armenia's industry was especially dependent on the Soviet military-industrial complex. About 40% of all enterprises in the republic were devoted to defense and some factories lost 60% to 80% of their business in the last years of the Soviet Union, when massive cuts were made in national defense expenditures. As the Republic's economy faced the prospects of competing in world markets in the mid-1990s, the great liabilities of Armenia's industry are its outdated equipment and infrastructure and the pollution emitted by many of the country's heavy industrial plants. In 1991, Armenia's last year as a Soviet Republic national income fell 12% from the previous year, while per capita Gru's national product was 4,920 rubles, only 68% of the Soviet average, in large part due to the earthquake of 1988. The Azerbaijani blockade that began in 1989 and the collapse of the international trading system of the Soviet Union. The Armenian economy of the early 1990s remained far below its 1980 production levels. In the first years of independence, inflation was extremely high, productivity and national income dropped dramatically, and the national budget ran large deficits. Post-communist economic reform Armenia introduced elements of the free market and privatization into their economic system in the late 1980s. When Mikhail Gorbachev began advocating economic reform, cooperatives were set up in the service sector, particularly in restaurants. Although substantial resistance came from the Communist Party of Armenia and other groups that had enjoyed privileged position in the old economy, in the late 1980s, much of Armenia's economy already was opening either semi-officially or illegally, with widespread corruption and bribery. The so-called mafia, made up of interconnected groups of powerful officials and their relatives and friends, sabotaged the efforts of reformers to create a lawful market system. When the December 1988 earthquake brought millions of dollars of foreign aid to the devastated regions of Armenia, much of the money went to corrupt and criminal elements. Beginning in 1991, the democratically elected government pushed vigorously for privatization and market relations. Although its efforts were frustrated by the old ways of doing business in Armenia, the Azerbaijani blockade, and the costs of the Nagorno-Karabakh War, in 1992, the law on the program of privatization and decentralization of incompletely constructed facilities established a state privatization committee, with members from all political parties. In middle 1993, the committee announced a two-year privatization program, whose first stage would be privatization of 30% of state enterprises, mostly services and light industries. The remaining 70%, including many bankrupt, non-functional enterprises, 
were to be privatized in a later stage with a minimum of government restriction, to encourage private initiative, for all enterprises. The workers would receive 20% of their firm's property free of charge, 30% would be distributed to all citizens by means of vouchers, and the remaining 50% was to be distributed by the government, with preference given to members of the labor organizations. A major problem of this system, however, was the lack of supporting legislation covering foreign investment protection, bankruptcy, monopoly policy, and consumer protection. In the first post-communist years, efforts to interest foreign investors in joint enterprises were only moderately successful because of the blockade and the energy shortage. Only in late 1993 was a Department of Foreign Investment established in the Ministry of Economy to spread information about Armenia's investment opportunities and improve the legal infrastructure for investment activity. A specific goal of this agency was creating a market for scientific and technical intellectual property. A few Armenians living abroad made large-scale investments. Besides a toy factory and construction projects, diaspora Armenians built a cold storage plant and established the American University of Armenia in Yerevan to teach the techniques necessary to run a market economy. Armenia was admitted to the International Monetary Fund in May 1992 and to the World Bank in September. A year later, the government complained that those organizations were holding back financial assistance and announced its intention to move toward fuller price, liberalization, and the removal of all tariffs, quotas, and restrictions of foreign trade. Although privatization had slowed because of catastrophic collapse of the economy, Prime Minister Ron Bagration informed the United States officials in the fall of 1993 that plans had been made to embark on a renewed privatization program by the end of the year. Global Competitiveness the Armenian economy's competitiveness is low and stagnating according to the Global Competitiveness Index, in which Armenia's ranking slipped from 80th out of 132 countries in 2006-2007 index to 93rd out of 131 countries in the 2007-2008 index. Armenia ranks 82nd out of 144 economies according to the 2012-2013 Global Competitiveness Index. Index of Economic Freedom Armenia ranks 39th out of 179 economies according to the 2012 Index of Economic Freedom. Armenia is ranked 19th freest among the 43 countries in the Europe region, putting it above the world in regional averages. Domestic Business Environment Armenia ranks 32nd out of 185 economies according to the 2013 Ease of Doing Business Index. Armenia's economy is competitive to a few extent with government-connected individuals enjoying de facto monopolies over the import and distribution of basic commodities and foodstuffs, and under-reporting revenue to avoid paying taxes. Despite pronouncements at the highest levels of government on the importance of free competition, Armenia is next to last in the effectiveness of its anti-monopoly policy according to the 2010 results of the World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Report. According to Varam Nursishans, President Serge Sargsyan's chief economic advisor, businessmen holding state positions have turned into oligarchs who have avoided paying sufficient taxes by abusing their state positions, distorted markets with unequal conditions, breached the rules of competition, impeded or prevented small and medium-sized business entry into manufacturing and thereby sharply deepened social polarization in the republic. Following the advice of economic advisers who cautioned Armenia's leadership against the consolidation of economic power in the hands of a few, in January 2001, the government of Armenia established the State Commission for the Protection of Economic Competition. Its members cannot be dismissed by the government. Monopolies according to one analyst, Armenia's economic system is anti-competitive due to the structure of the economy being a type of monopoly or oligopoly. 
The result is the prices with us do not drop even if they do on international market, or they do quite belated and not to the size of the international market, according to the estimate of a former prime minister, Ron Bagration. 55% of Armenia's GDP is controlled by 44 families. In early 2008, the State Commission for the Protection of Economic Competition named 60 companies having dominant positions in Armenia. In October 2009, when visiting Yerevan, the World Bank's managing director, Gozi Okonjoi Wheeler, warned that Armenia will not reach a higher level of development unless its leadership changes the oligopolistic structure of the national economy bolsters the rule of law and shows zero tolerance towards corruption. I think you can only go so far with this economic model, Gozi Okonjoi Wheeler told a news conference in Yerevan. Armenia is a lower middle income country. If it wants to become a high income or upper middle income country, it cannot do so with this kind of economic structure. That is clear. She also called for a sweeping reform of tax and customs administration, the creation of a strong and independent judicial system, as well as a tough fight against government corruption. The warning was echoed by the International Monetary Fund. Major monopolies in Armenia include natural gas import and distribution, held by Amros Gazprom, Armenia's railway, held by the Russian-owned South Caucasus Railway, oil import and distribution aviation kerosene, held by Mika Limited. Various basic foodstuffs such as rice, sugar, wheat, cooking oil and butter are figure close to the country's leadership. Newspaper distribution, held by Haymamel. Former major monopolies in Armenia include wireless telephony, held by Armontel until 2004, internet access, held by Armontel until September 2006. Fixed-line telephony, held by Armontel until August 2007.